Welcome to GW Institute for Korean Studies, or GWIX. I'm Yeon Ho Kim, Associate Director at GWIX. Uh, thank you for joining our GWIX interview series. Uh, we have launched this program for interviewing prominent GW alumni working in the policy field. And our second interviewee is uh, Chun Hyung Kim, Chancellor of the Korea National Diplomatic Academy. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, Chancellor Kim. Uh, he was a member of uh, Moon Jae-in's presidential election camp, where he advised on and formulated major foreign policies. After Moon was elected, uh, Dr. Kim joined the Government Transition Committee and became a member of the Presidential Commission on Policy Planning. He also served on the advisory committees to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Unification, and the National Security Council. Good evening, Chancellor Kim. Thank you very much. I'm humbled by the invitation. And welcome to your alma mater. Mm -hmm. uh, before we start the interview, uh, for those who are not familiar with the uh, Korea National Diplomatic Academy, can you uh, briefly explain what kind of role the academy plays? Yes, actually it has a long history. Uh, like, like education for new diplomat for institution is had started uh, 1963, actually my birth year. Anyways, I have uh, some kind of connection there. And now it's like a big institution, actually two, two big parts. One is education for new diplomats. That's, that's, that's the first uh, and the foremost important. And at the same time, re-educating the rank and file uh, diplomat. And the other part is a research uh, institute. This is uh, like it's called IFES, Institute for Foreign Af uh, Affairs Studies. So this is Think Tank uh, under the wing of MOFA. We are not apart from, we are actually belong to MOFA. And some, some country has like education part uh, institution and the research is separate, but you know, 2012 actually we combined and as a, became a bigger institutions. And that's why I, you know, my position name title is a little awkward, is Chancellor because this IFANS has already president. You received your MA and PhD from GW. Uh, my first question is, how did you find your GW graduate uh, experience? What made it so award uh, rewarding to you? The sounds, George Washington University sounds so good, attractive. And the Washington DC, actually, you know, uh, the capital of the strongest country. And then I thought I, if I entered this school, I could meet any, you know, important person and figures. Uh, but the surroundings and the mood that I experienced, little far from my expectation, but I never, you know, uh, regret my decisions. How did your uh, GW experience lead you to the next step uh, in your career? You know, frankly speaking, you know, especially when we are entered, we're talking about this uh, graduate school, I think we can have dual identity. One is scholar, one is teacher. You know, especially when we decided to go abroad and study, I wanted uh, to become teacher more than the scholar. So I wanna finish as soon as possible and I go back to Korea and to teach Korean students. Somehow after I graduate and actually I tried to uh, uh, try uh, both identity I pursue. Which is great. <laughs> um... Yeah. <laughs> You have been involved in the Moon Jae-in government's foreign policy uh, uh, making process. And uh, my question is, what made you decide to engage in this exciting work? Yes, that's, that's somehow is, you know, that's 10 years, somehow is an accident, I think. And then I actually met him way before uh, he became president, actually. He failed once, as you know, in 2000. I think it's 12 or something. I think it's 2012, he failed. He was a, a candidate for opposition party. And I, at the time I advised him too. And I liked his personality. And, you know, I'm, I was really excited to advise someone who will become a big figure to change the world. Actually, I'm not from like a student movement, like a high uh, rank or, or, or a leader at the time. 
I was kind of self, you know, <laughs> uh, grown uh, uh, progressive here. And, you know, I wrote some articles and, and columns. And actually, these leaders, of opposition leaders, including Moon Jae-in, and who is this guy? And find her, him because I have no connection there at the time. So I was picked and I was called and I talked to them over uh, brunch or lunch. And then they liked me. And somehow at the time, nothing rewarding, no money, <laughs> no promise. But I like talking to them and I like uh you know, to tell them about the foreign policy. Uh, what would you recommend to a college student who is interested in a similar career path as yours? And I told them, don't try to think too much <laughs> and don't try to, to be too smart. And, you know, after 10 years or 15 years, you never know what to do. So now you just, just study hard and then just what you do, do what you like, you know? You know, these days, especially in Korea, you know, because they're studying so hard until they, you know, enter college, they don't know what to do and what's, what's the path they are taking. So oh, I told them then, you know, just if you like it, just go ahead. And if you don't like at the end, then you can come back and then try again. Life is long, you know? And uh, you president elected 77 years old and then 78, you know, next year. And, and Trump, he said he's going to retry and at age 80. So life is long. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, let me shift gear to talk about the new challenges after the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in your new book, uh, The World After COVID-19 and uh, U.S. Elections, you discuss the changing role of the state and uh, uh, discuss the Korean case also. So can you explain why this is important? I think really important uh, because, you know, this is the, actually, you know, I predicted the Biden's win anyways. And in, in, you know, actually, this published one month ago, and then actually, I heard, I'm really brave enough to to predict. The first chapter is about the uh, pandemic and the impact of pandemic, because that actually tells us what kind of state we are going to have, and people call it this return of the state. You know, we used to talk about the retreat of state, you know, because of the globalization. But this pandemic reminds we need some kind of public institution, which is state. But as we know that the Western democracies, actually they have very weak and small uh, state because market is too strong and market, you know, they keep state at bay. And this, you know, state is always considered, you know, like they are interfering market or they are symbol of authoritarian state, but state has this public side. I think it's really important. This is public health issues. It broke up. Now somehow this state, that's why centralized state like China and some kind of, you know, uh, very state centric, you know, country is more functional, more, uh, agile to take care of this kind of problem. So this is, so who has a better system between China and the US? But this Korea has very different and in between at the same time, combination of the better too, because we have a, a, a very strong state, state because we experienced the war, you know, colony, colony, colony period. At the same time, we have uh, this Confucius traditions and the, we are divided country. So state had big apparatus, but at the same time, whenever this state, you know, go over the limit, then the civil society and people uprise, I think it's very unique and we are proud of it. That's why this Western country, they don't want to recognize Chinese style, but they kind of, we are kind of showcase as a success story of Western democracy.
The COVID-19 pandemic has not only imposed uh, challenges, but also provided opportunities in many parts of our lives. And I think diplomacy uh, wouldn't be an exception. So what is your take on that as the chancellor of the Korea National Diplomatic Academy? Definitely, this is a disaster. Definitely, this is a uh, you know, darker side. Uh, we have to admit that. But if you know, challenge always we can uh, challenge can uh, develop us and you know make us better. Actually, Korea history is you know that's the case of you know best case for that. We are surrounded by you know uh, geopolitical challenges and you know, all the uh, hardships we experienced. In that sense, we can make this uh, pandemic. Is a best case for, you know, human man, uh, humankind in the future. Uh, the intensifying uh, strategic competition between the U.S. and China made it very difficult for Korea to position itself uh, in the geopolitical game in Northeast Asia. What impact do you expect the incoming Biden administration would have on Korea's strategic calculations? Yes, you know, this is frequent question these days raised here, you know, everybody's worried about that. And, you know, the, the word, the term geopolitics, is that we, if we often hear this, that's not good. That's not a good sign, you know. Globalization is much better for us, you know, geopolitics. You know, our location, actually, we are like, um, you know, firepower is that we are second in the world. And the uh, defense spending, we are ninth. And actually we are, the, the GDP is between 10 to 12. We are very strong and powerful country. We are not very small and weak country. But surrounded by these big four superpowers, you know, and geopolitically and geographically. <clears throat> and, but, and in the whole world actually sandwiched by these two countries. You know, there is very uh, interesting statistics. 60 plus country has some kind of military uh, connection with, with the US from alliance to some kind of uh, 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 you know, uh, weapon sales. And on the other side, 110 plus country has China as number one trading partner. You know, that means, you know, world is, a, you know, a sandwich by this country. And especially we are, you know, our challenge is the, 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 the worst because we are divided country. And this Cold War system much weakened, but still there. So, you know, even if we have a, you know, a best economic relation with China is actually we are depending on more than 25% in our export trade. But at the same time, we have uh, alliance relation with the US. That means really uh, uh, unbalanced and uh, relations in that sense, we are in trouble, but, but that's challenge at the same time, you know, I always, say that we can have um, some kind of coalitions where we are like-minded with sometimes we could we call it like position, likely in a position the country. Is it possible for Moon Jae-in to be bolder and lead the new Joe Biden team to a smart inter interim deal with North Korea that includes increased space for South Korea's engagement with North Korea? That's a very good question, actually. And then actually, that's the appeal or, you know, voice from the more progressive side, like a civil society. This is our uh, territory. This is our issues. Uh, and Korean, inter-Korean cooperation can go ahead, you know. And some people say, you know, ignoring the sanction system or, you know, there are radicals out there that, but that's not the case for President Moon. I know him personally. He's a, such a you know alliance person. He's so, such a careful, cautious person. And you know, living in Korea, 
divided country as a progressive is very hard and I experienced. You know, whenever you talking about engagement with North Korea, right there, you are framed as commies and Antifa as said in, in America. So he is very careful about that. And just like Nomuyan and Kim Dae-jung before, and he's a, such an alliance person. And sometimes that's because of uh, his attitude as his approach, you know, more progressive people are disappointed. Uh, but I think he knows that he's, he, this is the time he can you know, bet on engagement and maybe he can be bored. <laughs> Given the existing tensions, uh, distrusts and feelings, people may feel towards one another, which was left behind as a result of the historic Korean War. I think it's about the, the, the inter-Korean relations. So what would be the best course of action moving forward? I, I, before, before I actually uh, get to this, getting to that question, actually, I you know, frequently asked by in Americans, actually, sometimes, you know, and actually this all the, all the uh, scholars who actually chastising me and then why do I have to worry more about the North Korean nuclear bomb than you? Why you think you South Koreans are so calm, you know, against this nuclear threat? And actually, I, at the time, I know where he came from, but the, the novelist Hanga and wrote this off ed opinion actually uh, in New York Times. I think he, she pinpoint, you know, this, this trauma the divided division of nations. And this uh, memory of tra traumatic memory of war, actually too big. So we can, we kind of uh, pretend nothing happened before. So if we remind it every day, then we cannot live daily life. And that's the her message. And I totally agree with it. So back to your question, best way, I don't know, but you know, I like the, the, the English word miss. Now miss has a two meaning. You missed it, missed the opportunity, missed the chance at the same time, because you missed it, because that's why you miss it. You know, we missed peace, that's why we miss peace. And I think something, sometimes North Koreans are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, pictures as a uh, no feelings or sometimes monsters, but they are, they have a fear to be attacked by the US, attacked by South Korea, because South Korea is 40 times richer than North Korea. The North Korea is the, the rank is 180th. So I think their security fear is immense, not only just the economic, you know, uh, issue there. So that's why, you know, we have a bad memory. We fought each other, but at the same time, we have a common goal that we wanna leave a secure land. What can be done uh, to improve the training and effectiveness of, of rock diplomats? Yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the you know, tasks that we are thinking every day. You know, we used to have this very difficult exam, which called we had the Goshi, you know, the, uh, before. Uh, and, we, you know, the people who passed this exam, actually after a few weeks of training, basic training, uh, they're sent to, you know, the country they assigned. But we said, that's not really good. We need, you know, diplomacy is not just, you know, uh, skills and the bureaucratic, protocols, it's more like a strategic mindset. We have to educate them, we have trained them. That's why we changed this exam to like a school, like a KNDA. So we got uh, this like a 40 or more, <clears throat> you know, candidate for diplomat. We are training them for a year. And then we all kinds of from humanities, from humanity to science and the cyber issues and all kinds of. 
Sometimes they, you know, writing essays, just like a, like a master degree. Of course, graduate schools are a little different, but at the same time, you know, they're, they're sent to overseas uh, embassy to train to work for one month and they sent to the uh, headquarters, MOFA and train and all combined. I think it's a really important one part. And the second part, after that, they, they are uh, dispatched to other countries. And then after one term, we, you know, draw them to, you know, uh, to Korea again, and then train more, and then, or give them a chance to study, uh, like a graduate schools all over the world, or language schools, like for two years. So education is a really important part of our program. Do Korean officials who have spent time living in the U.S. perceive the U.S. differently uh, from Korean officials who haven't? If so, what is the difference in perspective? Because uh, I'm not a career diplomat, so I'm not the right person to answer that. But if I, uh, if this is totally subjective uh, uh, opinion, uh, I think it's definitely, you know, leaving that country makes your worldview or the view of their country, that that country, you know, in that sense. But I think it's, it's uh, in different directions. Some people who actually leave their country, and especially the U.S., you know, they have a, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, kinship or, or you know, it's, it, as I, you know, I, I'm thinking of Washington as my second hometown because I lived there for 10 years and studied there and I met my wife there. So it's, and actually I had two kids there, but on the other side, it actually, uh, it, it happens a lot. You know, they have some kind of grudge or some kind of complaints, uh, some, and sometimes in animosity to, to their country. So, but usually mostly I think you have a good feeling, you know, departing the country with the good feelings. That's why, you know, foreign, 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 you know, MOFA and the State Department have to be divided into two groups. One is a regionalist and one is a functionalist. Now, usually regionalist has a tendency to become more moderate and to more understanding of their country. Uh, your thoughts uh, and expectations about the characteristics of uh, the expected cabinet members in President-elect Biden's administration, especially on North Korea. Um, do you have any expectation? I don't have expectation. This is a sovereign part of the U.S. and uh, but I heard, I have, I know many people actually who are related to this, you know, uh, camp, presidential campaign camp at the same time and the people from Obama administrations. And what I heard mostly, I think is uh, because, you know, Biden has an ear to listen to specialists and an expert, experts, you know, and, you know, about pandemic, actually Trump never listened to uh, this science and the experts. I mean, in that sense, uh, President-elect Biden is a totally different person. So in that sense, it, as a good pool of uh, people, good people and, and, and able people. So in that sense, I don't worry about that. Uh, it's a long question, but basically uh, the gist of the question is, so is South Korea comfortable with retaining China as its largest trading partner? And does it think uh, there are not any political risk uh, attached to such economic dependence? That is big asset for us, but at the same time, that's vulnerability that we actually experienced this thought uh, uh, related to sanctions. So uh, because of the thought incident, many uh, Korean government official at the same time, businessmen, they really kind of rethink of, you know, committee commitment and, uh, of business to, to with China. Actually, some people try to decouple a little bit, but it's not easy to decouple from, from because, you know, business is not like, uh, you know, government to government relations. They are, you know, money and efficiency is the most important. In that sense, it's hard to decouple. Uh, 
but there always some kind of worries there after this thought experience. And then this feeling of Korean people actually, you know, devastated at the time and disappointed. Oh, you know, I heard a lot from Chinese colleagues. They said, because they pushed South Korea too much. So that makes Korea more inclined to US. That's, that can be a strategic mistake. I'm not saying this is government position of China, but many people talked about that. When we have uh, the Biden administration um, uh, start their work uh, in late January, uh, when it comes to U.S.-Korea relations, what would be the most uh, immediate task do you think uh, we have to take care of? South Korea or North Korea? I think both, for both okay. yes. You know, the, one of the worries, because, you know, changing governments takes a lot of time to settle down and the review policy toward South and the North. And, you know, timing is not very... Uh, uh, favorable to Moon government, as I said, you know, and actually we are entering into uh, presidential elections. So pretty much from now to, to June next year is the time that we have to do something. Uh, in that sense, uh, many people worry about the loss of timing, but I think it's Biden's election can give us the uh, high hope, especially alliance. And especially this SMA, Special Measures uh, Agreement, which is a um, uh, burden sharing agreement. You know, we all know that actually this the negotiation team from both sides almost agreed. And then even, you know, this is the done deal. We thought it done deal, but vetoed by Trump. And actually we, uh, offered 13% increase from last year. And actually our defense expenditures, the most increase 8% a year uh, for the past five years. So that means it's a lot, it's a very big increase. So I think this SMA can be solved easily. And another issue is nuclear, you know, North Korean issues and you know, some people are worried about the revival of the strategic patience. Uh, at the same time, you know, working level or bottom of approach of Biden's expected uh, uh, approach to North Korea is not really fit for, you know, dealing with the North Korea because North Korea is, is top down. They like top down. And for the past 25, 30 years of this nuclear negotiations, usually Democratic Party, uh, you know, actually the one negotiators uh, and the negotiating tables from the North Korean perspective is either inspections, uh, inspections and report and denuclearizations and things like that. But I think, I don't think it's uh, Biden can, can go, you know, go back to revival can go back to the strategic patience, I think, in my opinion, that's done deal. And at the time, North Korea was not a nuclear power. Not now, it's uh, not only they, they, are, they you know, North Korea is nuclear power at the same time, but also they have a very diversified and advancement, advancing their nuclear capability. So I don't think it's really realistic to denuclearize overnight. I know a lot of people in the camp, they realize that we have to have a more realistic approach, but if they pick that, and then that's a good sign. What is your perspective on Korea relying its economics on the US and its national security on China? I think the other flipped, okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think it was flipped. Is this possible under the new uh, Biden administration in comparison to the to what we had under the Trump administration. Uh, he's basically asking uh, whether this is sustainable with okay. the new administration. Uh, okay. I'm not, actually, I'd rather not use the sustainable relationship. I think it's a very, it's not really uh, desirable, actually, structure that we have. But that's the reality. 
uh, some conservative, many conservative here that we have to pick sides. That means decouple completely from China. And then we have to choose US because security is more important over China. But I think that's really, really not responsible, irresponsible and unrealistic. You know, we are not dictatorship country, authoritarian. We cannot order business to come out, you know. So, and it takes time, at least two decades we need to decouple. So it's not realistic. So this is, I know it's a very tight rope. We have to work. I don't think the government is reasonable enough to push us to choose sides over the other. And the question is, how serious is South Korea about a nuclear powered submarine? Although the Moon Jae-in administration has been cautious about nuclear energy, it seems eager to push a nuclear powered submarine, which, is, which seems inconsistent. What's your response? Yeah, I admit that even if I am a government official, but you know, this is actually No Muyun's legacy, you know? And people are really, you know, nationalistic people here, even progressive. Why can we have nuclear power? You know, North Korea trying to get it. And this is, a nation, you, know, you know, some politicians appealing for this nationalism among people. So uh, in that sense, we cannot have it. And, and some people try, but we cannot have it. So kind of uh, coming down as a method to calm down people's desire or zeal for having nuclear power. Why don't we have this nuclear motor, you know, powered uh, submarine? But actually including me and some people, you know, that's, I don't think it's a good idea to having that. that to, and I don't think US is, you know, of, for that idea either. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Kim, for taking the time to, to speak with us and uh, let us uh, hold you for extra five minutes. I really appreciate that. I, okay, I actually, I'm really honored and I, I'm really happy to, even though I can see you and I can meet him face to face, but I enjoyed and I'm, I thank you very much. With that, let me conclude to, uh, today's interview with Chancellor Kim. Uh, everybody stay safe and healthy.